It is 11.48 a.m. At precisely this time on Saturday the 1st of September 1923, Tokyo was struck by a series of earthquakes. On the other side of the world, in England, recorded on a machine buried underground in a laboratory in the Lake District, the tremors looked like this. In Tokyo, these pulses of ground movement and the chain of events they set in motion destroyed half a million buildings, reduced two-thirds of the city to rubble, provoked national economic collapse, and left 140,000 people dead or dying. In just five minutes, they released the same energy as all the explosives and ammunition used in the Second World War, multiplied 300 times. Earthquakes like this have struck Tokyo for the past 12 centuries. By coincidence, they occur regularly, on average, every 69 years. This year is the 70th anniversary of the last one. Today, Tokyo is a city of 14 million people and a global economic power. It is six times larger than it was when the last earthquake struck in 1923. The next earthquake here will devastate the city and plunge the world into economic crisis. The world is not prepared for that earthquake. Tokyo is not prepared. This is Rio. He is six. Like children all over the world, he plays games, he eats too quickly, and he goes to school. Rio's school is in Tokyo. The land it is built on is worth the same as half of Mayfair. The games he plays are special too. This is one that everyone in Tokyo is invited to play for one day every year. It's called Earthquake. On this day, the people of Tokyo prepare to protect their city from a repeat of disaster. They practice what they will do when an earthquake comes, how it will feel when it happens. They prepare for disaster beneath their homes and their offices, their hospitals and their schools, beneath one of the most concentrated collections of human life on the planet. But there is hope in the people's hearts, because while they are practicing, this is happening. This is the gathering of Tokyo's top minds in earthquake science. They've been nicknamed the Six Wise Men. They are what should really protect the city from disaster. Handpicked by the government, the Six are the centerpiece of Japan's most important scientific endeavor. No other country in the world claims to have their equals. Their job is perhaps the most crucial in Japan today. It is to predict and give advance warning of an earthquake. In the knowledge that the six wise men are installed to protect them, the people play their part in the preparations. Their approach is a little light-hearted, but to live otherwise in Tokyo would be impossible. It's hard to worry constantly about the threat of earthquakes and the devastation they have wrought in the past. It's hard to remember families and friends killed in the last one, to remember the 40,000 people who burnt to death on this very spot. So the earthquake prediction network does the city's worrying for it. 24 hours a day, this room in the heart of the city, equipped with the latest Japanese technology, keeps a check on the ground beneath the country's feet. 
Here the people watch. Watch for the telltale signs that will precede an earthquake. Watch so they can give the city the vital days of warning it will need. If they detect signs of impending disaster, it will fall to the six wise men to judge their significance. They are the experts, the final check. Japan depends on an accurate warning of disaster. The people expect it. Today, the head of the six wise men demonstrates how they will give it. They will hold a press conference, have the prime minister on national television within hours. Their message will be clear. Abnormal data have been found. Within two or three days, a large-scale earthquake may strike. It's a reassuring display a demonstration of what Japan expects will happen when its earthquake history repeats itself. It's autumn. There is a warm breeze blowing south to southwest. The air is moist and mild, and humidity is at 80%. It's a weekday. In the harbour, the water is calm. The tide is one meter, just below the high water mark. On a pleasure boat, families and friends are enjoying the sun and the smell of the sea. Amy and her friends are amongst them. Hello. 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 My name is Amy Sumitani, and we are going to the Maritime Museum right now. My name is Megumi Yamauchi, and. The dockside is a hive of morning activity. A party of friends from a city bank are spending a day together away from the office. <laughs> Across the bay, businessmen are proudly displaying their company's products at the Japan International Machine Tool Fair. And girls from the local high school are planning a lunchtime shopping spree. Local families in Kita Ward are practicing emergency drills. The sense of community is strong. Aki is home early because today lunch is special. It's the leftover bits from the Japanese dish of raw fish. Deep fried, sizzling hot and sprinkled with salt it's Aki's favorite snack. Aki's mother cooks it in the traditional way, in a wok over an open gas stove, still the most common type of cooker used in Japan. Grandma keeps Aki out of the way until it's ready. Restaurants are getting ready for lunch too. This is Mikabe-san. He owns a successful sushi restaurant in a prosperous business district. Around here, his carefully made lunches are legendary. These are all raw sushi. That's uh, tuna slices rolled in rice, pollock, and that's cod rolled in rice. This, this one is sea bream. There's uh, more tuna and there's squid. And here, the, these are prawns. And all of this is a serving for one. At the Tokyo Stock Exchange, Japan's financial pulse has been beating a little fast. Already this morning, over a billion pounds worth of stocks and shares have changed hands on the floor. Nearly all Japan's business and industry is centered here in Tokyo. Just up the street from the Stock Exchange, this office contains a publishing company. Hello, my name is Mami Yabe. I work at this office. Mami is a sub-editor. Hers is a typical busy Tokyo office. Although the city covers only a tiny amount of the land area of Japan, a quarter of all Japanese live and work here. Office space is expensive and cramped. I work at this office, at, at this desk. <laughs> OK. Th this is 
the book about television culture. I edited this book. Despite its ultra-modern faith, in Tokyo, the traditional is never far away. At the National Theater, it is the last rehearsal of the morning for the Bunraku puppeteers. Bunraku is one of the oldest traditional art forms, and Yoshida Tameo is one of the oldest of the puppeteers. He's been working here since he was 14. At 74, he has been named by the government as a living national treasure. It's not just a question of moving the puppet around, but rather of knowing all the different little movements it might make if it were alive and breathing. If it were upset, it would cry like this. At a bridal design studio, it's time for final preparations. Today's bride is Yayoi. Normally she works here, but this morning she's taking her first steps into a new life. Her whole future is in front of her. These are the premises of Yagi-san. He makes tatami mats, the traditional Japanese floor covering. This is one of the few places which still weave the rice straw mats by hand. I learned my work from my father. He was the first generation of tatami weavers in the year Showa 2, that's 1927. He passed his skills on to the family. Tatami since I was about 20. And I'm now 64, so that means I've been doing it for 44 years. Yagi-san runs the business with his son and his younger brother. And soon, he hopes there'll be a fifth generation to carry on. This weekend, his son is getting married. This is Tokyo. It is a prosperous, successful, and well-ordered city. It is a world financial center and a home for 14 million people. Suppose just before noon on this autumn morning, Tokyo's worst nightmare comes true. An earthquake has started out to sea. Waves of earthquake energy are traveling towards the city. As far as Tokyo is concerned, this is the very reason the Earthquake Prediction Center exists. But they didn't raise the alarm. They didn't spot any warning signs. That is because they do not know what a warning sign is. Despite their demonstrations, neither the Earthquake Prediction Center nor anyone in the world today knows how to predict an earthquake. In no other country on Earth does the population rely on a government-sponsored science of disaster prediction. Only here, in the most earthquake-prone land in the world, is myth championed as life-saving reality. It is 12 o'clock. Yagi-san has six hours to finish this week's order before stopping work for his son's wedding weekend. The earthquake starting out to sea has released the same energy as 27,000 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons. Waves of earthquake energy are groping towards the city, and no one in Tokyo knows anything about it. No six wise men were called, no press conference was held, and no prime minister gave two days warning on national TV. The moment when a machine at the earthquake prediction center records the earthquake happening out to sea is the first anyone knows of impending disaster. The time between that and the earthquake waves reaching the city is nine seconds. Yagi-san is sure that if he gets a warning, he can save his friends and neighbors. Today, he hasn't even time to save himself. Three hundred and forty-one thousand wooden buildings like Yagi-san's home collapse or partially collapse in the first few seconds of an earthquake.
across the city, 46,000 reinforced concrete and steel framed buildings are also collapsing. Buildings of different heights respond to the shaking in different ways. The ones most susceptible to damage are between two and 20 stories high. Tall modern buildings are considered safe. That is, they are unlikely to fall. Mami faces a different problem. In all buildings in central Tokyo, up to half of all furniture and equipment will be thrown over. In buildings between 20 and 30 storeys, the contents of the top three storeys will be shaken like a dice. Mammy's office is filled with objects that could fracture her skull. In the event, it's her bookcase. In the home, the first thing you are supposed to do during an earthquake is to turn off the gas main. Most people don't bother. Mild tremors come often and are quickly passed. How many will wait to see if today's tremor passes? How many will realize too late that it won't? How many will be able to help their family, their children? How many will be able to fight the fire that is now spreading? A house fire takes only five minutes to become uncontrollable. Outside, objects are falling from buildings. The Japanese authorities list them under two categories. Scattering objects are glass, tiles, stone slabs and reinforced concrete fixtures. Non-scattering objects are advertising hoardings, water towers, balconies and chimneys. Today, the distinction is academic. A building like this contains 160 square meters of glass. It is in the street outside Mikabe-san's shop and along from Yayoi and her wedding party. In the inner Tokyo area, over 46,000 buildings rain a mixture of concrete and glass from heights of up to 300 feet. Window glass falling from heights of over 10 feet will tear through paper and fabric. From 15 feet, fragments will puncture human skin. From 80 feet, they will penetrate car roofs and stick in asphalt. The resulting wounds are horrendous. In Maccabi San Street, the most common ones are lacerations to the face, arms and head, skull fractures, concussion and crushing injuries. Across the city, communications and power supplies are failing. 40% of electricity lines and a third of all telephones, faxes and computer links are cut. At the Tokyo Stock Exchange, trading stops. The silence will be heard around the world. After 40 seconds of shaking, 27 square miles of the land on which Tokyo is built turns to liquid. Buildings sink under their own weight. This is because of liquefaction. Liquefaction is a startling phenomenon. When the ground shakes, soil settles. Water is forced to the surface. Land suddenly stops acting like land and starts to act like thick water. This process will continue for as much as several minutes, even after the ground shaking stops. In the Tokyo area, 806,000 buildings have collapsed, partially collapsed or been destroyed by liquefaction. 9,300 telegraph poles have fallen. Water supplies have been cut to a third of the city. 20,000 people are injured. 15,000 are dead. It is 12.02 p.m. The shaking of the earth is over. The real problems are just beginning. Inside the earthquake-proof city government headquarters, these people have the task of picking up the pieces.
They are the staff of the city's disaster coordination center. Their main problem is fire. This is taking hold across a third of the metropolitan area. They must get emergency vehicles to the fires immediately. On the roads, cars are colliding. Traffic lights have failed. Bridges are out. Tarmac has buckled and subsided. It is along roads like this that emergency vehicles will have to pass. In the harbour, Amy and her friends have been on a boat. They have been safe on the calm water away from the quaking. They have not been in danger. At least, not until now. Out to sea, the sudden movement of the seabed at the moment the earthquake started created a wave. It has been travelling towards the city. Normal waves, even if driven by the strongest of winds, travel only at around 60 miles an hour. This wave is not normal. The Japanese call it a tsunami. It has been racing towards the city at a devastating 500 miles an hour. It will obliterate everything in its path. Elsewhere in the city, the devastation is taking another form. Fire engines are stuck on congested and collapsed roads. Fires are out of control. Fighting them is now the responsibility of the local community. The average temperature of a house fire is hot enough to melt aluminium. These people have a small water pump and hand extinguishers. Tokyo may now face the most terrifying killer of all. Firestorms. Within one or two minutes of a fire starting, temperatures near the flames are so hot that human hair will singe and burn. As the fire takes hold, temperatures rise. Skin will blister, blacken and burn. After two to three hours, temperatures in fires are so high that the flames rise at an incredible rate. Fresh air rushes to fill their place. This inrush of fresh, fuel-laden air can become a tornado. It can whip the flames and superheated winds at up to 125 miles an hour. This is a firestorm. Conditions within it are devastating. After the 1923 earthquake, a firestorm developed near an evacuation site for earthquake survivors. At midnight, the light from the firestorm was strong enough to read by at a distance of 10 miles. It was fueled by the blankets, clothes and salvaged belongings the earthquake survivors were carrying. Survivors is perhaps an inappropriate word. One of the major causes of the firestorm was overcrowding. The park into which the people were huddled was a little larger than a football field. There were 40,000 people there. 30 survived. These are the ashes of the rest. To avoid the risk of firestorm today, the government recommends that each evacuee and their belongings be allowed two square meters of land, a space a little larger than a bathtub. Fewer than one in six evacuation sites have that much. One site is even next to a petrol station. On 95.8, this is Capital FM. In the world, news of the disaster in Tokyo is spreading. Tokyo has been devastated by an earthquake. Ben, have you Thousands had any reports on damage or injuries? Greenwich Mean Time this morning, the city was struck by an earthquake measuring over 6.5. We have been able to establish contact with anyone uh, right now. 
Bonsoir. Le président de la République, François Mitterrand, on the Richter scale, she said, quote, it's pretty severe. Prime Minister Miyazawa, on a state visit to America, has cut short his trip to return home Stock capital damage in Tokyo is estimated at 103 trillion yen. Analysts fear that the Japanese raise that money by selling their investments overseas. Paid with the money presently supporting the U.S. Fear sent markets crashing. In London, both sterling and share prices suffered badly today. It seems now that a rise in base rates massive. within the next few hours is inevitable. Uh, the events of the last couple of days, coupled with fears... Banks and building societies say they have no choice but to follow suit. ...over 500 cars a week will shut from Friday with the loss of all jobs. Union officials speaking after the announcement... Well, that means the world is going to be short of those electrical consumer goods we all like so much. More than 95% of video recorders, CD players and radios. Retailers are predicting a rush to buy before... Computer games are changing hands at up to five times the pre... The problem is that uh, our supplies are dwindling at the moment. Uh, we ran out of uh, one, two, three or four different VCRs yesterday. It is three days since the earthquake in Tokyo. One million people have offices and homes without water, gas, electricity and telephones. Three million people have no homes at all. They are living under blankets in two square meters of mud. 205,000 people are injured. The medical and emergency services are overwhelmed. Makeshift morgues in shopping centers and sports halls are full. The risk of epidemic is high. It's autumn. And in the richest city in the world, the bodies of 150,000 men, women and children, twice the number killed by the atomic bomb blast at Hiroshima, are burnt without ceremony in the streets. Amy and her friends are amongst them because they were unlucky. Mikabe-san is amongst them because objects are badly attached to the outside of buildings. Mami, because her office space is overcrowded. Yoshida the puppeteer, because fires cannot be tackled quickly enough. Yagi-san and his family, because the earthquake prediction center failed to give the city a warning. And Rio? Rio is six. He plays games, he eats too quickly, and he goes to school. And one day every year with the rest of Tokyo, he plays at earthquakes. That film was based on research 